All right, uh, title of the sermon this morning is The Roles of Husband and Wife. The Roles of Husband and Wife. I just want to talk about um, this passage in Ephesians 5 and um, talk about you know, how God has the family ordered and uh, why it is that way. Because I think what's, what's important is not only that we know how God has it ordered, but I think it's also to think also important to think about the reasons why it is that way. So at least you can rationally understand why God has it in a way that he does. So we'll talk about that and then we'll also talk about the actual roles themselves and go into that passage a bit deeper and hopefully you can reflect on that uh, this morning. So first of all, before we get into Ephesians 5, let's go to 1 Corinthians 14. And I want to show you from 1 Corinthians 14 that God likes things in order. You know, he's a God of order. He's not the God, a God of confusion. And this is why authority structures exist in our society, not only in the home, but in church, there's an authority structure. And also in government, there's an authority structure as well. 1 Corinthians 14. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. So you see it's a bit, he didn't want the church to be like sort of anarchy, like everyone just comes and then everyone just does it the way they do it. There's, there's leaders in a church and there's order and, and there's authority there. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three and that by course and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For you may all prophesy one by one, that all may learn, and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So we're just applying that sort of principle to you know, the family as well. And God doesn't want confusion, he's the author of peace, and he wants order. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. So a lot of people misunderstand that verse. That doesn't mean women aren't allowed to talk at all amongst the body, right? This is talking about teaching the congregation, like you're seeing here now. Women shouldn't be up here teaching the whole congregation. Um, that's a job for men. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, co co covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. And this last verse in particular, let all things be done decently and in order. See, so God is a God of order. And order is created when there's an authority structure, right? You can't really have order when, it's, it's like they say, too many chiefs, right? Or too many Indians, right? Or they, they say too many chiefs, not enough Indians. That's, that's the problem when there's too many people in charge. You need less people in charge so there's a bit, bit of order. So order in the church and order in a nation, I mean, it obviously starts uh, in the home, which is what we are talking about today. Um, now, in our society today, like these roles are under attack. You know, they're trying to, you know, redefine the family and now family's not mother and father. You know, marriage isn't even man and woman and uh, there's all this crazy stuff that goes on in the world. But we know that God knows best, you know, and if you want to experience a, a blessed marriage, you know, we ought to embrace the roles that God has because he has them like that for a reason rather than resist them, right, and understand why it is the way it is, right? So let's talk about that first. Why the man is the head? Why, why, is, why is the man in charge and not the woman, right? Because you say like, well, you know, I mean, why can't the woman be in charge? Wouldn't you have just as much order if the woman was in charge and not the man? So why is it one or the other? Well, we can understand when we think about, you know, too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Um, that there's a reason why they're not both in charge, right? Because if they're both equally in charge and you have obviously two heads in a family, then how do you, where, where's the tiebreaker, right? So one of them has to be in charge in order for decisions to be made. Otherwise, how are decisions finalized if there's equal authority within that family, right? So that's why there is one person in charge. Now, why is it the man rather than the woman? Well, 
you know, we could, as Christians, just say, well, you know, well, that's how God, God said it that way, so that, that should be good enough for us, right? But God has some reasons why. You know, there are reasons why that man is the head of the home rather than the woman being the head of the home. Now, the first reason is in Hebrews 13, verse 17. Look at what it says here. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourself. So this is not just talking about husband and wife. This is talking about in any area of authority that if there's somebody in authority over you and it's a legitimate authority over you, that, that we should be submissive when you know, we're following that authority structure and that um, hierarchy of power that is in place. Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls, right? So the idea of authority is not to be abusive or oppressive and dictatorial. The idea is that they are taking care of those that they have under them, right? They have their best interests at heart. As they that may, must give account, right? So that's the key point there, that people who have authority are generally accountable for the people under their care. So why do you say, why is the man in charge and not the woman? Well, God holds the man account for his family, right? Just like man in the beginning was accountable. Adam was accountable for creation. That's why when he sinned, that's when um, a creation fell. It wasn't when Eve sinned. So remember, when Eve sinned, creation didn't fall. It was when Adam sinned because Adam was accountable, right? So it's the same in our family. Because the man is held accountable, that's why the man is given the authority to um, you know, have that power over his family because he's ultimately responsible for them. That's why he has to protect them. That's why he has to provide for them. That's why you know, if the family is not in a good spiritual state, then really the man should be taking up that banner and, and where the buck stops at him, right, in order to rectify it because God's going to hold him more accountable, more than he is the mother, right? Obviously, the mother has some influence over the children, but the buck's going to stop at the father. So that's one reason, right? Authority comes with accountability. And because the husband is accountable for his family, um, he must be given the authority over them, right? I mean, imagine if you are like given a job at work, you know, and, and you're accountable for it. But I don't know if you've ever been in that situation at work where you're accountable for something. Maybe you've got a KPI for something, but you really have no authority over the situation. You're just trying to influence. It's very difficult, right? And then if you're held accountable for other people's errors that you have no authority over, where you, they don't directly report to you, I mean, it's not a good situation. It's not, it's not really a fair situation to put you in. So that's one. Authority comes with accountability. And you know, this is why we talked about, we just allude to Ephesians 5.25. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church, look, and gave himself for it. I mean, he's expected to look after the well-being of his family. He needs to have the authority in order to make decisions to exercise that, um, that ability, right, to take care of them. So you can see that the authority, the intention of the authority is not there to be like self-serving and to be abusive and oppressive. The authority is there in order to take care of of the family. No different to the authority in a church is not given so you lord over the flock, like the Bible says. You want to be examples to the flock. So the idea of the authority in a church is to, to take care of the church and for the best interests of the church, and it should be the same in governments as well. But, you know, like in anything to do with human behaviors, unfortunately, it's not always the case. It doesn't mean that's not how God has it. Just because, just because authority can be abused, that doesn't mean that it's the wrong model and we shouldn't try and strive to follow it. So sometimes people will sometimes discount the way God has things just because leaders abuse their authority, right? But just because leaders abuse their authority, that doesn't make it wrong to have leaders and uh, the right type of leaders, whether it's family, church, or government. What's another reason? First Timothy 2, he says here, but I suffer not a woman to teach. So if you Compare that to 1 Corinthians 14, where he says women keep silence in the church. This is the context, right? The context is teaching the congregation. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. Why? For Adam was first formed, then Eve. So one reason is that's just how God has ordained it, that he created man and then he created woman to help the man, right? So that's just why God has it. But then he gives another reason here as well in verse 14. He says, And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived 
was in the transgression. Now I understand that a lot of the things I'm saying right now is not popular in today's day and age. But the, 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 the fact of the matter is, what God is saying here is that women tend to be more easily deceived than men. And as man is the protector, you know, this is why sometimes men are a bit more rational thinking as opposed to emotional thinking. And women can be a bit more emotional. And I think it's sometimes that emotion can lead them to be more easily swayed, right? I mean, even think about in the political debate. Like, you know, it's always emotional and things like that. And that, that tends to sway women more than it sways men because men tend to just, you know, get to the point and, and think about things and things like that. And that, that joke is always told, you know, just the stereotype of, you know, women just want somebody to listen to and man just wants to solve the problem. But that comes from this idea that, you know, men tend to be more just, you know, thinking about the, the, the issue as opposed to making an emotional issue. Um, but I think that factor plays into the fact that women are more easily swayed. And the danger there is when you have leaders that are more easily swayed, they're more easily deceived. And this is the problem here where um, why are men in charge? Not only did, did God ordain it that way, but because women are more easily deceived, man um, is, is, a more, is, is more geared towards being that stable leader to take care of a flock, take care of a family. So, you know, in, and I'm not saying like in some cases, you know, it might be the opposite. Right? In some cases, you know, you may have men that are more emotional than women. Just like in some cases, I'm sure there are women out there that are stronger than me, right? You know, they can beat me in an arm wrestle and whatnot. But then, in general, men are stronger than women. In general, women are more emotional than men. And because it's like that, for the sake of society and for the sake of the family, it's good that women embrace that role, even if they may be less emotional or more clear-minded than their husband. You still got to think, well, I want to set the example for the next generation. So I don't want to like boss my husband around and I don't want to be the leader of my family because that's not good overall for future generations. And, you know, society basically is a bunch of families, right? So if, if the family gets it right and society gets it right, church gets it right, and it'll flow on to, um, you know, pol politics, which is basically society as well. Okay, so... That gives you a few reasons why it's that way. So basically, you know, why is it one person? Well, it makes sense because it doesn't make sense if it's two because you're kind of a tiebreaker. Why is it the man? Well, because he's given the accountability. And then one of the dangers as well with women being more emotional is they're more easily deceived. But, you know, the, the flip side of that is, is that because women, I think God made them that way so that they are a better carer. You know, often, you know, men are a lot, I think, are harsher on their children. You know, men are a lot more, you know, just you know, very cold, right? And I think, uh, you know, women bring that sensitivity to the family and to issues that men uh, would not otherwise do. So I think it's, it's not that it's a, a negative thing. I think it's positive, and that's why there's the two different roles. They, they play their part in a, a healthy, uh, a godly family, all right? So that's why man is the head. Number two. Let's look at now the commands to the wife in Ephesians 5, verse 22 to 24. So we'll go back there. Ephesians 5, verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. All right, so I'm just addressing this one first because it comes first in, in, the, in the order of things in, in Ephesians 5. But a couple of thoughts here in Ephesians 5. When, when we think about submission, right, submission doesn't mean that you can't have an opinion, right, that you can't voice your concerns, that you can't, um, you know, take initiative or, you know, have, have some proactiveness about how you do things. I mean, submission is not that I just wait until I'm told what to do and I only do what I'm told what to do and I have no other opinion. Um, it reminds me, every time I think about this, it always reminds me of that movie, Coming to America, right? And he gets that bride and it's like, he's like, what do you, what do you like to eat? It's like, whatever you like to eat. And it's like, what music do you like? Whatever music you like. It's like she doesn't have any mind of her own. So this isn't what submission means. Right? Submission just means that there's an authority structure, you know, and, and you submit when a decision is made in areas, you know, that, that, that needs to be made. I mean, think about this. Like, we all have bosses at work, you know, unless you're, you're the boss yourself. 
but we all have bosses at work and, you know, and we submit to them, but that doesn't mean we're not useless. I mean, that doesn't mean that we're useless and we are not proactive and we don't, you know, go about our, you know, and, and have decisions that we make our own and can't voice our concerns to the boss. Like, that's not disrespectful just to say, hey, boss, I, you know, there might be a way that you need to approach things, you know, when you approach authority, you know, there's a, there's a way that you entreat people that are above you in authority, but you get the idea that, you know, you, 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 you don't think submission, I mean, submission in a family is no different to submission at the workplace where you have a boss that you answer to. It's like in a family, like the wife has a boss that she answers to. So it's a very, it's a, it's got some similar principles and obviously it's not exactly the same. I mean, you don't want to be sleeping with your boss at work unless you're married to your boss, you know. So we all have bosses at work that we submit to. Um, you know, think about how a church serves Christ. So we say, we see here that in verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Now, doesn't, shouldn't a church be busy serving the Lord? You know, so you can see how submission is about getting busy doing what's right, but within the guidelines set by your authority. It doesn't mean that you can't be proactive and be busy doing things. And in fact, Jesus tells us to occupy till I come, right? And occupy in the, in the Bible you know, it means to work, it means to get busy. You think about an occupation, right? So it's not like Occupy Wall Street where they're just sitting there in tents and just taking up space, right? It's, it's Occupy means to get busy and we're meant to be doing that until the Lord returns, right? So think about submission in that sense, not just a sort of passive sense. Now, like it says here in verse 24, therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Two more things I want to mention about this verse. You can see here that it's not just spiritual things that the husband has authority over his wife. So, you know, this authority extends, you know, beyond just things to do spiritually, right? Like, I mean, it just be things in the house or whatnot. So, you know, it's, it's not just only if your husband asks you to do things that are spiritual, right? Even if he asks you to do things that are like physical in nature and just, you know, neutral in nature, the wife should be submissive to those as well, right? So that's one thing I want to point out. The other thing is that it says, so let the wives be to their, hus to their own husbands in everything. So some people get this idea that, you know, the, 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 in the church it talks about men being in charge, right? So, so the men take up positions of leadership. The men are the ones teaching and things like that. But that doesn't, what that doesn't mean, right, is that every woman must do what any man tells them, right? Because some people get that mindset too, where when it talks about women, you know, being in subject to authority and things like that, it's not that you just have to listen to what any man tells you, right? It's saying that men are in leadership in the church, but women who are married, right, obviously a woman that isn't married should listen to her father, but wives are obedient to their own husbands, right? So they're not just subject to every man, right? Which, which I, I've seen in the past, you know, in, in, in some church cultures where they just think women should just be submissive and just do whatever men tell them. No, it's, it's you have authority in your life, um, whether it's your father, whether it's your husband, or whether it's leadership in church, right? So it's not just um, men bossing women around in general, right? Um, now, obedience is, is not always easy, right? And even when we talked about before, I mean, when leaders are either abusive or oppressive, you know, but it doesn't mean that they're not the leader, right? Now, it might take some discernment. You know, we talked about convictions of the conscience. It might take some discernment on what, you know, directions to follow from authority and what not to, you know, that's not always a clear-cut line. But... Even besides that, like, I mean, it's not always easy, especially with ungodly husbands, ungodly bosses. But I think what you have to realize is your actions can have a profound impact on their response to Christ. Right? Look at what it says here in 1 Peter 3. He says, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. So you see there again, it's not just in subjection to every man. In subjection to your own husband. 
that if any obey not the word, right? So here is a husband that is not doing what is right, right? He's not obeying God's word. He says that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of the wives. Now, I think it's very important that we understand a couple of things here, right? So he's saying here that without the word, right, without the word of God, they're saying the example alone. That's why he's saying, hey, even without the word, you know, being preached to them and them exhorted to follow God's word. It says, maybe one by the conversation of the wives. Now, it's important to note that conversation in the King James Bible means your lifestyle, right? So I, I, I think women should understand this because I think it's important because, you know, correcting your husband is not like the, the necessarily the best way to go about things, right? In terms of just nagging and nagging and nagging, which is what some women do, right? And they think, oh, I'm just giving him a hard time, just give him a hard time, give him a hard time. But what the Bible is saying here is, you know, if you are in subjection to your own husband, you know, your example may do more than you just verbally correcting him all the time. So it says that if any obey not the word, they, may, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives, right? Their, their, their character, their lifestyle, the way they live. While they behold, right? While they look at, right? Not while they hear. See, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair, or of wearing of gold, or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So like I was saying before, just because somebody is submissive, that doesn't mean they don't have an opinion, that doesn't mean they can't voice their opinion, but it'll give you the idea of, of what should be the emphasis, right? If we are trying to, or as a, as a woman, you are trying to influence, right, your authority, or even in, in, at work, you can take these same principles. I mean, if you want to influence your boss, sometimes your ethic as an employee is going to speak a lot louder in your boss's eyes than you just complaining and telling your boss this is how it should be all the time. Likely, he's going to listen to you more, sort of work you up. So same principle can apply in a family, right? I mean, the sort of wife you are will to, to change your husband's response to maybe your requests. But you can see it, you can, you can, you can obviously um, voice your opinion and, and voice your requests, but look at the sort of attitude that it should be done, right? Down here, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So meekness, they say meekness is not weakness, right? That's why when we talk about humility and meekness it's not weakness it's what do they call it they say it's power under control right so meekness is about knowing your place it doesn't mean that you are a walkover you don't have strong opinions you don't have you're not able to voice your opinions you don't have boldness it just means you know your place and you are submitting not because you are weak you're submitting because you just know there's an authority and you're respecting what god has commanded so here, this passage is, is a very important one, I think, for, for wives, you know, in terms of how we go about, you know, impacting our, our other half. Titus 2, look at what it says here. It says, The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands. Look at this, that the word of God be not blasphemed. You see that, that, that these things that are mentioned in Titus 2, and it's not just about obedience, right? It's discreet as well. You know, discreet is when you have some discretion, right? You're not just a loud mouth. You don't just say things inappropriately, you know, things like that. Discretion, chaste, right? So it talks about chastity, purity. Keepers at home, you know, you're responsible for your, for your home and your family, you know. It's, I mean, I, I think, like, you know, uh, women that have, like, you know, messy homes and all that sort of stuff, they should, they should take a bit of shame in that and say, hey, you know, I'm not keeping my home. Uh, that's what God wants me to be responsible for. Obedient to their own husbands, you know, sober, love, the, love their children, love to love their husbands. 
Right? I mean, how many women do you see? Like, they're always bad-mouthing their husband. You know, they hang out with all their friends, and then they make their husband look like an idiot in front of everyone. And it's like, you know, you're loving your husband when you're just destroying his reputation amongst your friends, you know, and, and like, you know, doing all that. And, and that goes both ways for, for, for men and women. But, you know, not to, not to love your husband, you know, and build him up. Why don't you help him ha to have a good reputation amongst the community rather than destroying his reputation because you know all the ins and outs of your life. Of course you're going to know, you know, you live with him day, day by day. You know, you know all these things. Of course you're going to be able to rip him down. But don't do that as a woman. But see, if you don't, what's the danger here? The Word of God be not blasphemed. So like I talked about in the beginning about, you know, are there some cases where, you know, a woman might be a better leader than her husband. She might be a better leader than, you know, in a church situation or whatnot. But you do it for the sake as well of God's Word because God has it like that for a reason. And when you go against that, as especially as a Bible-believing Christian, the Bible says, hey, these, the Word of God will be blasphemed. Right? So this is why it's important that we try and walk in the Spirit as much as we can. And I always like to share these verses when we talk about uh, you know, women as well, because I think they're quite humorous. But Proverbs 27, 15, a continual dropping in a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. Look at this, Proverbs 21, 9, it is better to dwell in a corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. I mean, I'm sure this happens in many, in many um, marriages, unfortunately, that are not following God's, God's, God's ways, is that they can get violent, you know? And, and I, I would say men tend not to fight back, but sometimes women, because they're the, the, the weaker vessel, like the Bible says, they just feel like they can, you know, lash out and just, uh, you know, abuse their husband. Um, and, and sometimes husbands don't always fight back. But it says here, look, it's better to dwell in the corner of the housetop than with a brawling woman in a wide house. And Proverbs 21, 19, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and an angry woman. And I just, what I always just find hilarious about these, these verses is just the way they escalate. Like Proverbs 27 is from a different proverb, but it's like a continual dropping. It's just like, you know, this is what a contentious woman's like. It's just an annoying dropping. Here it's like, hey, it's better just be in the corner of like, you know, your attic somewhere to be in the house with a brawling woman. And then Proverbs 21, 19 is saying like, you'd rather just live out the forest somewhere than, than to live with a contentious and an angry woman. So I, I, what I, what, but what I think is important to take away from these verses and why I share them, I don't just share them because they're a little bit humorous. I share them as well because I think it's important that women understand the impact they can have on the environment in their home and amongst people that, you know, if, if you are, you know, you know, sometimes women are like grumpy and you know, use their periods, you know, to, to make excuses that, you know, all that sort of stuff to just be, have a sour attitude and things like that. So I don't think you should do that. If you, if you find yourself guilty of doing that, don't do that because these sorts of things can have a very negative impact on the environment in your home and the environment amongst your family and amongst your children. So please keep, keep that in mind. All right, number three. Now, let's talk about the husbands now. Let's talk about the husbands. Commands to the husband. All right, Ephesians 5, verse 25 onwards. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, to me, I think that is the most confronting bit of the whole passage because, you know, you know this is basically commanding husbands to have this sort of love, the sort of sacrificial love for their wife that they will, you know, in essence, take a bullet for them, that they will die in their place. And this is this idea of, you know, like in the Titanic, you know, where like women and children go first and the men have to stay behind and basically freeze to death, you know, as the Titanic's going down. But this is the idea that if you have the choice between saving your wife's life and saving your own life, you save your wife's life. This is the sort of love that God, you know, expects from husbands. So you can see, like, well, why does the husband have authority? When you understand the gravity of the responsibility that he has, then you can see that, I mean, that's, that's, a, reasonable, that's a reasonable situation, right? I mean, if I have to die for my family, shouldn't I get to call the shots, you know, <laughs> if, if my life is on the line? So it can make sense that it, it's, it's that way. But... You know, this is very confronting, right? Because, it's, and I think this is why 
you know, God emphasizes this in Ephesians 5 because, you know, our natural tendency is to be self-serving, right? And how many young men, even when they, uh, you know, may listen to the first half of this sermon, I mean, they'll, they'll joke, ah, oh, you know, when I get married, now I've got a servant in the house and, and somebody's going to cook and clean for me and wash my clothes and, you know, and sleep whenever I want with them and all that sort of stuff. They can't even say no going to the Bible. You know, they, they, they have these ideas, right? And obviously, you know, because every young man, I'm sure, has thought that before. I was a young man once and I thought the same thing. So, but here we see what is the right attitude that men should have towards their wives, right? What men should have towards their future wife, right? Is this authority is given to you not to be oppressive, not to be abusive, but to take care of your wife. And it's interesting that in Ephesians 5, I mean, there's only three verses, directed to the woman, but there's six verses as we go through here that are directed to the men. I mean, does that not tell us that God is trying to emphasize the man's responsibility twi almost twice, twice as much in this passage as the uh, woman's responsibility? So husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, right? So not only did he suffer, not only did he live righteously. So, you know, giving yourself for your wife is not only you know, it's not only, um, you know, in a life or death situation, you know, it's like you, you, you live however you want, you live an ungodly life, you don't care about her, you don't care about the things that go, oh, but if uh, somebody's going to shoot her, then I'll take the bullet, right? So Christ didn't only give himself for us in the sense that he died for us. I mean, he also, remember, he lived the perfect life. He lived a righteous life. That was part of what he did for the church in order to be that sacrifice. So he lived a righteous life. He died and then he, he suffered the eternal consequences, right, of hell. And he paid for that in three days and three nights and then rose again. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men. So right, in, in this way, right? So we, we love our wives in the way Christ loves the church. It's not only about giving your life physically in life or death. It's about living a way that is in the best interest of God and will serve your wife. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. Right? So you take care of your wife. You take care, you take care of them. But look, at it's not just nourish. It's nourish and cherish. Right? So that is also appreciating them, right? It's not just, um, you know, providing for them. Because sometimes men get that idea too. Oh, yeah, well, well, I provided her house. I provided her everything she wants. And then now I'm going to go play my video games. Or now I'm going to hang out with the boys. Or now I'm going to do, do my own thing, right? Yeah, she's got everything she needs. Well, yeah, you, your, your role is not just to nourish, right, your wife. It's also to cherish her as well, even as the Lord, the church. See, the Lord doesn't just provide for us and then not care about us. The Lord doesn't just provide for us and not listen to our prayers, not answer our prayers, not be with us, right? Husbands ought to be the same thing. Now, can anyone read this passage in Ephesians 5 and think that God condones husbands as abusive or oppressive dictators? You know, and people get this idea that, you know, Christianity is just, oh, this patriarchal, oppressive, you know, men are in charge. No, no, this is what God means when men are in charge. He doesn't mean, you know, that you're abusive and oppressive and self-serving. I mean, look here. I mean, the whole passage is about loving your wife. It's about doing what's best for her. It's about, you know, you know trying to build her up spiritually and, and, and it's saying, you know, you should do this because if you don't do this, then you don't even love yourself, right? It says, he that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet, yet hated his own flesh, right? You know, we often uh, joke about the saying, um, you know, happy wife, happy life. And, um, you know, often people 
talk about that in the sense of just pacifying their wife. You know what I mean? Like they pacify their children. You know, as long as their children, you know, just, just pacify them and give them everything they want, and then I'll be happy. And I think if men do that, they, they are setting themselves up for failure, right? So you don't, you know, when you love your wife, it doesn't mean you just give her everything, everything she wants and just keep her happy, just get her off my back, you know. But the idea here is we get this idea of happy wife, happy life, right? In the sense that if you love your wife, it's like you love, you're going to love yourself in the sense that, you know, if you invest time building up your wife and building that relationship, obviously you'll reap the rewards of that too. But, you know, the idea is we want to do what's best by our wife, not just do what is convenient to stay at peace, right? So your job is not just to keep your wife happy at all costs, right? To help her grow in the faith and in spiritual maturity, right? So do men have the authority to command their wives? Yes, according to God. But the authority is there so that they can ensure that they are, you know, protecting them, leading them, you know, providing for them, teaching them, you know, making decisions for her own good and helping her to grow and to be that, to be that godly example, right? So it says, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. So you know what that means? That means if you love your wife less than yourself, then you're failing at that command, right? The man is failing at that command if he thinks, no, I, I care about myself more than I care about my wife, right? They should be at least equal. That's the minimum here, right? To love their wives as their own bodies. Now, like I talked about, it's giving Christ giving himself for the church and a, and, a, and a husband giving himself for his wife is not just about the life or death situation, right? It's about living a righteous life too. So the last passage I just want to talk about is in 1 Timothy 3, where we see the attributes or the qualifications of somebody who can take up the role or can be ordained into the role of a bishop. Now, oftentimes people will look to these qualifications and think, well, this is the level of character and the level of, I guess, leadership or uh, qualifications or ca characteristics of somebody that is in authority. And they'll, and they'll have the idea that, well, you're in a position of authority, or you, you are a pastor of a church, or you're a, you're a leader in this instance, so you must live up to that, uh, that uh, what's the word I'm looking for, that uh, standard of living. But that's not, that's not the case, right? This standard of living is expected from all men, but it's just the men that meet that standard or are judged to have met that standard should be ordained into the ministry. So you don't want to read through these qualifications and think they don't apply to me because I'm never going to be a bishop, right? They do apply to you. It's just that God is saying if somebody does fulfill these, then only those you should ordain into the ministry. 1 Timothy 3, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work, right? So the bishop is the overseer, what most people would call the pastor, but the, the, the correct term for the office in a church or the, the job role is bishop, right? Pastoring is something that is done by the bishop, but pastoring is something that can also be done by other church members too, right? Because think about what a pastor is. A pastor is just like a shepherd, right? A guide, uh, you know, leader. So anyone that has sort of people that look up to them you know, and a community around them that they're an example to. I mean, they're fulfilling that role as a, as a pastor of those people, right? Now, helping to encourage them in the right direction. But the bishop is the actual office within the church. It's like the official role within the church where, you know, they, they, make, they may make decisions. They have authority. But pastoring is just one of the things they do. They teach as well. A bishop then must be blameless. The husband of one wife. So I always think it's very interesting that the first requirement for being a bishop is, you know, that it's your family, right? That's the husband of one wife, right? It's the fact that he's faithful to his wife. Vigilant. So the reason why I'm going through these is because I think 
I want, I want the boys here and also on the live stream to take notice that, hey, these things I should be striving for too. It's not just, I, I don't need to necessarily strive for them to the level that God wants because I'm, I'm never going to be a bishop one day. I don't have the desire to be in the office of a bishop. We should all strive for this, right? To be vigilant. I mean, this is the, what does vigilant mean? It means that you know what's going on, right? You're, you're vigilant, you're aware, and you are noticing danger when it comes. The husband of one wife. So, you know, faithful family man. Right? Not somebody who's a whoremonger and you know, flirting with other girls and doing all that stuff. He's faithful, right? In, 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 in his wife, to his wife. Vigilant. Sober, right? So that not only is about drunkenness and about, you know, mind-altering drugs. I mean, sober is just about having a clear head, right? And being serious about things. Of good behavior. Given to hospitality. Right? So it shouldn't only be your wife that makes your home, you know, a welcoming place. You know, I mean, a man should also be given to hospitality too. So that means like friendly and, you know, welcoming and, you know, a, you know, a servant. I mean, if you think about being hospitable, hospitable is about being a servant, right? Given to hospitality, right? Apt to teach. You say, well, I'm never going to teach. That doesn't mean you shouldn't strive to be a teacher, right? Because you will... One day you have to teach people. If you're going to be a father, you're going to have to teach your children. So don't think, well, I'm never going to teach in a church. I don't need to learn these things. Well, one day you're going to have to answer to children. So learn these things and, and get used to how to explain things. And you know, the more you know it, the better you're going to be able to explain it. So you want to be apt to teach. You know, not given to wine. That's self-explanatory, right? You're not a drunkard. No striker. Right? So you're not, just, you're not violent and getting into fights all the time. No striker. Not greedy of filthy lucre. Right? Covetous and you know, doing dodgy things for the sake of money. It's like this filthy lucre where you know, people get themselves into a lot of trouble because they you know, do shady deals and all that. But patient. Not a brawler. Not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? So you see there that part of what you know, God wants for a man is to, it's a righteous sort of living and a righteous sort of living so that you are able to rule your own house, right? And, and have the respect amongst your family members. How shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice. See, so not a novice meaning, and what does a novice mean? It means you're new to things. So everyone's new to things at some point in time, right? But you don't want to stay a novice. You want to stay like, man, I don't know, I still don't know anything about the Bible. I still don't know how to do these things. I want to just stay a novice. So it's not just, hey, it's all right that you're a novice at Christianity and a novice at things because you're not going to be a a bishop one day. No, right? You want to grow in your faith and grow in responsibility. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. So the reason why I'm going through this passage is just to make that point very clear that, you know, being in authority is not just about, you know, when push comes to shove, you've got to make the hard decisions, you've got to put yourself on the line. It is also about that consistent daily living in God's Word, walking in the Spirit and being that good example. You know, I mean, part of loving your wife as Christ loved the church is being the godly man you are called to be and being that example to your family, to the church, to your society and to the community that's part of being that loving person and giving your life like Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. So these things are not only expected of church leaders, but, they, but only if these standards are met, right, then somebody, you know, um, should be ordained into the ministry. All right, so just in, in closing, in summary, so it's important that we understand why God has ordained it this way. Right? Because this is under attack today. And it's, going, it's always going to be under attack. 
So I think it's important that you understand and are able to rationally defend. Hey, this is why it's this way. And not only that, I think we should embrace it, right? Embrace the roles. Don't resist them. We don't want the Word of God to be blasphemed, right? And we, and we know that God knows best. We want to set that example for future generations. And, and I, I think especially in our day and age, the more women that embrace the roles and can defend it, you know, sometimes in the political climate today, when, when sometimes women speak out against like these oppressions and things, you know, what they think are oppressions, you know, that, they, that their word often goes a lot further sometimes. I mean, if a man obviously is trying to promote women submitting to their husband, it doesn't always come across as well as a woman explaining why this is, this is good. So I think we can all bring things to the table and help this philosophical fight, right? Um, you know, and like I said, that we would teach and set the example for the next generation. All right, I hope that uh, you learned some things there and that was a blessing to you. Um, let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. And we thank you, Lord, that you've provided us with guidance in our life, that we could live and uh, live a blessed life as you intended us to live. And I, and I pray, Lord, for Christians, uh, not only in our church, but all around the world, that, uh, you know, have not experienced um, the sort of relationship that you intended for husband and wife. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help us have faith in your word, walk by faith, and embrace the roles that you have for husband and wife, and experience, Lord, um, the joys of the marriage relationship as you intended it to be. So we thank you, Lord, for um, Jesus Christ's example. Help us to follow in his footsteps. We pray in his name. Amen.